All right, I got some cases from last week I didn't get a chance to show, so I'll show those. Let me here. All right, so this is the, a case. Uh, so during the uh, contrast shortage, we I mean we've been doing pulmonary MRAs for as long as I've been here, and we we do them off and on depending patients who can't get contrast, or we, a lot of times our younger patients with normal radiographs. But we shifted a lot of our PE studies over to MR whenever possible, um, just to try to conserve some contrast. And so this is a case that happened during that. And so this was a, a young woman who came in with chest pain. And you can see on her frontal radiograph, she has pleural effusions, a little bit of atelectasis. So they did an MR on her, it didn't show a PE, but it was kind of nice. Um, and this may probably would have seen it on CT as well, but you'll notice uh, her pericardium is enhancing. And there's these little pockets right here of little fluid pockets that are enhancing. Um, so this is a case of viral pericarditis, um, and she had the the hospitalist note um, when they admitted her uh, looked like a pretty typical uh, appearance for that. Uh, you can also see it on some of the the, the MR images. So we do a, a pre-contrast, a, a, a pulmonary arterial phase, a, a delayed phase, and then one with a lower flip angle. Uh, and there's a little bit of motion on this one, but let's see if we can see any pericardial enhancement probably on the later lower flip, yeah, there we go, on the lower flip angle, you can see the all the enhancement of the pericardium. So acute pericarditis on a pulmonary MRA. Um, I like to think we would pick it up on CT, but it's a pretty small fusion, and depending on your timing, you may not see the pericardial enhancement. Okay, um, this patient has, a, is, uh, I believe, a um, frequent uh, visitor for various foreign bodies uh, and in this point had reported ingesting a razor blade and then a pen, a PEN pen, and you can see uh, here is the tip of that pen and there's something funny here in the right paratracheal region. Uh, he had a neck CT and a chest CT, so here's the neck um, and we can see he's got this large collection here posterior to the sort of upper aerodigestive tract that dissects down to the um, upper mediastinum to the, there, a little abscess tract there, and a lot of edema in the soft tissues. And um, this was just his chest CT, and you can see a lot of debris in there. And there's that pen tip. Whoops, I didn't mean, well, Let's see if I get back. Uh, there's that pen tip right there. And just a little bit of spread through the airways aspiration. So this is a, um, they could never find the razor blade, so I'm not sure what happened, but they did a neck exploration and he ended up uh, with a pretty, they had to clean all this out, but a perforation from that. And then uh, this is kind of the, I think the neatest case here. So this is a 19 year old um, female who presented with dysphagia. And uh, this is the outside CT and you can see, um, there's mass effect at the carina here, and you can see some soft tissue, but not much else in the lung except a little bit of uh, atelectasis here and some nice airway center nodules. So presumably some aspiration related to that. If we go to the soft tissues, we can see there's um, lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum, but notice they're peripherally and enhancing and centrally low attenuation. Uh, so this is all essentially necrotizing lymphadenitis here. There's the esophagus and Right, let's see, where was it? I wondered right here, there's a little bit of gas way up here, away from where the esophageal lumen is. So I suspect this is a fistula to this lymph node. And so this is all tuberculosis. Uh, so this is TB lymphadenitis involving the mediastinum and hyla with um, a uh, esophago lymphadeno fistula. And I, don't, I mean, I've seen TB lymphadenitis cause airway strictures and stuff, but I've not seen it involving the, um, the esophagus. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that or esophageal TB. No, I have not. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, it's interesting. I saw a case of um, coxie that uh, Chuck Roman did an upper GI on, and there was a fistula from the esophagus to a... Um, 
node in the upper mediastinum or lower neck. Um, same idea, you know, necrotizing lymphadenopathy. It looked a lot like your case here. So mm -hmm. one of those cases of coxy that looks a whole lot like TB. Yeah, we've seen a lot in this webinar over the years. We've seen uh, coxy peritonitis. We've seen uh, other, you know, yeah, coxy tends to look a lot more like TB and less like histo. And histo can give you a necrotizing lymphadenitis. It's called mediastinal granuloma. It's pretty rare. Uh, I've seen it one time where they get nodes that look like this. So if, if this, um, that would be something I would think about. It's just, it tends not to erode into as many things, um, probably just because the immune system handles it better. But sometimes they'll go resect those nodes if it's limited um, or if they're causing mass effect. But in this case, this is all just TB and should hopefully respond with antimicrobacterial treatment. So those are the, uh, go ahead. Do they have any relevant, uh, do they have any history like HIV or anything? No, about? from an endemic area. So that's the relevant history. Okay. So um, is this an immigrant then or? Yeah, this is, is, yeah. This is a pa this is a patient from Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, originally. But yeah, no HIV that I was aware of. Yeah. So they, yeah. So the, the enhancing uh, lymph nodes and necros centrally necrotic stuff usually more common in uh, pediatric uh, pediatric uh, TB cases. But it can happen. Obviously, happen in adults. But in adults, it, they tend to be more uh the, the like severely immunocompromised right but uh right, the, the scrofula is more common in kids yeah that's a very good point well you know i think you know i looked looked at this years ago uh, <clears throat> and the notions of the the pri the presentation of primary tb that was said to be the pediatric presentation was things like lymphadenopathy and pleural effusion uh, so those things were supposed to not occur in adults, but the reason was that the people who got TB were children, and the adults grew up, they'd had TB as children, and so the manifestations that you saw in adults were the manifestations of uh, chronic, you know, indolent or, or leftover TB, not primary TB, because all primary TB was in children. But then as, as TB was eradicated pretty much in this country, uh, the people who had those primary manifestations became adults. They became people like, you know, people in jail and not necessarily with HIV. So I think that the, the manifestations that we attribute to pediatric age group are really the manifestations of primary TB. So I've seen a lot of cases of necrotizing lymphadenopathy and pleural effusion in adults who did not have HIV. So I don't think it requires immune compromise. It's just that if you're an adult, when you get primary TB, you're going to have the same manifestations that kids with primary TB had. That was long-winded. That makes sense, though. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It'd be like if we did, yeah, if we saw a lot of primary histo and people had never been exposed. Yeah, a similar thing was that it was said that um, a lot of lung cancers um, developed uh, in association with TB. It was really just because there was such a high prevalence of TB that when you saw, you know, a lung cancer, it was somebody who already had TB right. as an adult and to get lung cancers in upper lungs. So that's where we see the manifestations of remote TB as well. That's a good point. All right. So who would like to go? I have one cute case. Oh, a cute case. And I only have two, so I don't have a whole lot. Okay, this is a, um, a young woman, I think, uh, who has um, had shortness of breath and had a CT scan here for diagnosis of pulmonary emboli, and lo and behold, has pulmonary thromboembolic disease. So you'll see that I can get you a good window here. You see there is pulmonary thromboembolism on both sides. So um, I don't know what... Uh, you know exactly what her, <clears throat> what they looked for at the time, but eventually she had an abdominal CT scan, and um, so this is a few months later, and you can see that she has a largish inferior vena cava, and then it gets very large. So 
down near the kidneys, we have this huge aneurysm of the IVC. And then as we get down to uh, the branch point here, we still have some megaly here, but not as gross. So this is a, uh, let me show you here on this uh, MIP. Here's this big venous aneurysm of the inferior vena cava. And it really starts at the level just below the, the renal veins here. So, you know, I don't think I've ever seen this before, but this is uh, an IVC aneurysm or a aneurysm, which are said to be quite rare. I think I have a, uh, I think I have a PDF to show you here. So here's the article I pulled up on a quick, quick search here. It says there are rare, only 18 reported cases. So maybe this is number 19. Um, this is probably congenital in this person. And it's uh, probably a type three, which is the one that's confined to the infrarenal IVC without an associated any venous anomaly. So this person had thromboembolism, which is one of the presentations that these authors list in this brief uh, case report. So have you guys seen this? I've not seen this condition before, but <clears throat> from now on, anybody that has a PE is going to get a search for IVC aneurysm, at least if I have any say in the ordering of exams. I've seen I it in the one, but that's it. OK. So venous aneurysm. Um, here's a new case. And I'll look up more history on see if I can flesh out uh, what I told you, because I haven't looked it up so far. OK, guys, that's it. That's a cute case. Thank you. All right, Peter. OK. So I'm gonna uh, I'm doing it from home. So I'm gonna use uh, Paxpin again. So hopefully it'll. Yeah, I was messing around with it the other day. It works great. Yeah, I'm not loading the studies. Uh, isn't the easiest for me, no. especially if it's more than one. But uh, is it? You think it works better than the than the other stuff that you're using to to post your cases online? Are you going to um, replace it? With I mean, I keep them in my Osiris web server, but like if you're building okay. the, the quiz functions, pretty neat, and it does let you order the studies. So you could put radiographs first. You could order MR sequences. Um, but the beta uploader they have is actually pretty good. It lets you like if you have like in, in, uh, what do they call burned in PHI, you can box it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've only only the beta uploader you've worked for me. Yeah, I had trouble with the other one. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't like some of my DICOM compressions, but it seems to work okay. Because I was putting together a couple of like um, sets of cases for the incoming first years to use when they're on chest. Um, so I was like mm -hmm. one with because right now I just pull stuff up in packs off my list, or if I have it on Osiris, but it, you know I'm on a little laptop. It's nice with with that I can load it up on the packs through the web browser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't show the diagnosis and you can put them in a specific order of cases, build a little quiz, and then you can like have the residents go through the cases with you or independently and, and do a lot of things with it. So I think it has potential. Cool. I'll look more into it. Um, okay. So uh, this case, uh, uh, yeah, I, just, I ran into it recently. Uh, so your screen when I just, I'm not seeing it. Oh, I didn't share the screen. No. I, I thought I, can you share it? Can you send the request again? Yeah, I'll just take it back and send it to you. Or maybe I hit cancel. I don't, I don't know what. Try now. Okay. Can there you see go. it now? All good. Okay. okay, so we will start with this radiograph. So, yeah, so this is an abnormal appearance here. And it almost looks like a cardiac, weird, large cardiac border. Obviously, uh, or down here, you want to have kind of the same uh, radio density or attenuation. It needs to be homogenous. So this is abnormal. Um, okay, so let's go to the CT. So there is the abnormality. It's got a little, a little bit of calcium. Um, small left diffusion. 
So it's a mediastinal mass and the typical uh, the typical uh, differential is given for anterior mediastinal mass, uh, but it ended up being none of the, uh, just looking back at the report, it ended up being not one of the things on the, not one of the common things you think of, the, of in the anterior mediastinum. So a uh, thymoma uh, with, the ca with the calcification hemangioma was listed. And a few other things, I don't remember exactly uh, what the other th things listed here were, but um, uh, an MR was done. What's up? I was, well, I was going to ask, it yeah. almost looks like it's following the course of a structure. Yes, yes, that's a good point right there. Yeah. yeah, I think you're on the right track. <laughs> and the MR was done. I didn't, let me pull up the MR. And I tried to load some sequences here. So. This one, this one is T1, free contrast. Um, this is just an SSFP or a T2 weighted, so you can see just a heterogeneous signal, but there's areas of high signal intensity on T2 and T2 weighted. Uh, this one is post contrast. So large areas of uh, not not enhancement, and then there are some post of enhancement. But yeah, I mean, I think the main the main yeah, it's it's well circumscribed. But I think the main thing uh, what what Jeff was saying is it's following a, a course here. The other thing that to, to notice is, uh, and you can pick that up on the radiograph, is that the left uh, diaphragm is elevated. So this is a phrenic nerve phrenoma. That's a really nice example. Um, so just something to consider uh, on your differential for masses in that region. Peter, did you have a coronal from the CT that would? Oh, that uh, let me. I don't think so, because I yeah. And then unfortunately, let me go back to it. I and unfortunately, I don't think you can reconstruct them on on this. It does. Yeah. It does look elongated on even on the on the chest radiograph, top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is. Yeah, coronal. Is nice. Yeah. Uh, the distribution of this thing, it's it's really a elongated thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's right right along the. That was a very good observation. And then uh, you can, can see we, the. Let, let's see how the cruise is doing. Can we go down to? see what, whether the cruise is thinned out on that side i don't see a major maybe it is a little bit thinner on the left side because if it's yeah a little bit at least yeah. okay cool yeah it's it it's wispy. yeah good reminder to look at the cruise it's crucial <laughs> Okay, and then the other case I had was kind of a complex case I had to deal with yesterday. Uh, and uh, I was the only person in cardiac because usually usually we have a cardiology fellow that does all the protocoling and but he's out. So I had to deal with this case and it was kind of a complex case. Uh, I'll open it up. So the story is I'll start off with the Start off with the first CT. So this is from a few weeks ago. Uh, really sick patient, and you can see here they have a fistula between their coronary sinus and uh, left atrium. Uh, they also have a bioprosthetic aortic valve between the coronary sinus or aortic root. Uh, aortic root. Well, yeah, I mean the sinus. The coronary valve. sinus. You mean the sinuses of Valsalva or? Sinus, sorry. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was a, not the correct way to say it. yeah. The sinus of Valsalva here of the non-coronary cusp, what I mean, in, in the um, left atrium. And I'm not sure exactly how this happened. It, it might have happened when they were putting in the, the mitral valve, this bioprosthetic valve. Uh, but they, the patient's really sick and they can't, they couldn't do an open repair. So they decided to do this uh, heroic uh, 
uh, transcatheter replacement, and they decide to um, put a first. They're going to try to seal this by putting a T-var in the ascending aorta, and then on top of the T-var, they're going to put a uh, transcatheter a taver. So a taver through this bioprosthetic valve. So there's going to be a T-var, a taver, and then they're going to put fenestrations for the coronary arteries. Uh, and put stents into the coronary uh, ostia to keep up, to keep the coronaries open. So they do that procedure, and then uh, the day before yesterday, but unfortunately they can't get the patient off of, they can't, can we take them off bypass because the uh, right heart starts failing, and they think that they also can't engage the right coronary artery, so they want, and that the patient has to be put on VA ECMO, so they wanted me to scan them while on VA ECMO to look for the, uh, to look at the right coronary artery. So uh, scanning people on the ECMO, I think is pretty challenging because um, uh, it's just really hard to predict the contrast, but there is a there was a really helpful paper that was recently published. Um, I'll show it here in radiographics uh, by the group in Stanford, Dr. Fleischman. Uh, and then they kind of just show uh, some of the, some of the uh, pitfalls of scanning with uh, scanning while on ECMO, on VA ECMO. And one of the things is that you get uh, really like these mixtures of non-opacified uh, blood and contrasted blood, just because, it, and, and then there's like a, a cloud of where this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this happens right here. Uh, and then this, um, can be there be this boundary here can either be uh, can be in the descending aorta or it can be all the way up in the arch and one way to one way to predict that is by the flow rate of the of the uh, arterial cannula of the ECMO. So what I decided to do is uh, obviously you want you're going to need this opacified so I just decided to put the uh, uh, the bolus tracking ROI really close to the coronaries right here and then just try to bolus track it. And uh, I think it ended up ended up working okay. So here is the here is the uh, I had the ROI here, which you can't see it, and then you can I just triggered it. It triggered it, and then we got the images. So you can kind of see how uh, the kinetics here, the contrasts are very abnormal with ECMO, so the ascending aorta. Initially opacifies first because the arterial cannula delivers blood here. But uh, so here's the, the post-operative, so um, the post-operative state. So we have the T-var and then we have a TAVR within the T-var and we have the stents. But the main thing was here to just look at this uh, RCA. So what happened is that they dislodged the uh, the stent in the right coronary. So you can see the stent right there doesn't really uh, get into the coronary. It was dislodged and it's kinked. You can see that on the uh, coronal. So there's the RCA and then there's this kinked stent right there that just got completely completely dislodged. So basically, most likely what was going on is there's really high resistance. And so you do get some contrast specification of the RCA, but very low, very high resistance and probably low flow. So that was just a difficult case and I thought kind of challenging with ECMO. Yeah, for sure. And some heroic plumbing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll often just shut off the ECMO for 20 seconds or 10 seconds and mm -hmm. do this again. It works fine. Patients survive. Yeah. Uh, the people don't like it, but it's it's usually necessary for a lot of these. Yeah. Uh, anyways, that's that's how I've always done it, but uh, that technique works. Yeah. And we're, we're getting a lot more people with ECMO now than before. So Everyone's on ECMO. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's obviously it's I don't know it depends on your institution in Maryland they they were notorious they put if you had a cough you went on ECMO, so it was pretty crazy, um, but yeah everyone's on ECMO these days. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Seth, you got any cases? 
Yeah, I got a bunch. Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to show this because I showed this a, a couple years ago um, of this patient who presented with nodes filled. So I saw in a non-con CT with these nodes filled with air and um, all this necrotic lymphadenopathy and uh, even some of these nodes have air. You can also, also notice the uh, kind of granulomatous reaction in the chest wall due to the pumping of material into the chest wall. So this guy uh, did a partial, uh, I guess, gender change operation partially on his own, had HIV, and this turned out to be uh, um, MAI, non-tuberculous, actually mycobacterium avimens or cellular uh, RA. He had HIV, very low CD4 count. So um, anyways, just another case of an esophago. Um, nodal fistula from TB, well, different form of tuberculosis, uh, sorry, from the form of mycobacterium, not TB. Uh, this is a case I had over the weekend, which was interesting. Um, so this is a guy who came in, let me show the arterial phase real quick. So transfer from an outside hospital with the diagnosis of actually underwent, oh, why don't I just start there? He underwent a, he came in with chest pain and like everybody gets a PE study for chest pain. And on this outside PE study, they noticed all the hemorrhage in the mediastinum. And they also noticed um, this kind of crescentic area of um, hypoattenuation along the descending thoracic aorta, and then also they were concerned about the uh, ascending aorta as well, but then obviously had some sort of mediatinal hematoma and was transferred to us. And this is where it gets a little, a little interesting. Well, kind of interesting. So he has mediastinal hematoma, which is better. And unfortunately, we didn't do a non-con because I don't even know. I don't it wasn't protocol to get a non-con. And you can still see the crescentic stuff around the descending thoracic aorta a little bit. It's better. Um, the only area of injury or anything that I can even remotely call an injury was this little sucker here. Um, other than that, the aorta looked good. But the thing I was trying to relay to the surgeon, or at least the fellow, when I saw him was that, um, you know, there's some sort of an intimal injury probably going through the intima, probably outside the adventitia, given the fact that there's hematoma here. And it's extending along the descending thoracic aorta. But I really thought the stuff around the ascending aorta, I think better seen probably on the more delayed image, was not uh, a type A IMH. It was actually just mediastinal blood extending around the ascending aorta. And the reason I could kind of tell that is you have fluid in the superior pericardial recess kind of wrapping around the aorta here. So if you, you know, so this is fluid in the pericardial recess and this is blood. If this is gonna be an IMH, you're not gonna see fluid around from the superior pericardial recess between the blood and the aorta because this is a process theoretically starting at least in the intima. Um, I, I mean, I don't buy into the whole vasovasorum thing, but nonetheless, some sort of intimal injury. So you're not gonna see the separation. So I was trying to tell him that it really was presumably a type B IMH with that had ruptured, and um, but you know the ascending aorta was fine, so that discussion didn't have any effect on what they did. So they went in and um, took out the entire ascending aorta and the entire arch, and then stented the descending thoracic aorta. And of course, the path came back and showed that the ascending aorta and arch were completely normal, that there was nothing there. There was no IMH, there was no nothing. So unfortunately, you know, the, the option to go to surgery is, is fine. I mean, he has mediastinal hematoma. If you look at surgical textbooks, that's an indication to go to surgery. I was just kind of upset with them for not listening to me when I told them to really concentrate on the descending and, you know, not just willy nilly replace the ascending, which they did. So the basically guy wind up with this huge new aorta that he really didn't need. All he really needed was a stent graft in this little location. And um, anyways, so uh, 
it was actually a surgeon I didn't know. It was this, uh, over weekends, sometimes we have surgeons here that I don't know as well. So um, I don't know if anyone else has anything other comment to say on that. I just thought it was an interesting case to kind of differentiate between a type B and a type A IMH there. Um, this was a patient who had a uh, lung cancer who had a lobectomy and the uh, one of our attendings was reading a study and said this heart looks very odd, which it sure does. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a pre-op or a PA and lateral, but we did have an old PET CT. And this is something I just, you know, we just don't see that often. I mean, it's, it's just because, A, it's just really rare. But I think once you see it, you know immediately what it is. So this is the preoperative film, uh, the CT. Here's the little uh, adenocarcinoma back here. But you can notice that the um, whole heart is, heart's going in the wrong way, basically. And it's hard. It's a PET CT. I apologize. I don't have any great imaging. But the uh, surgeon did confirm which is what we suspected that there was in fact no that's a, I don't think we're going to see it here uh that there was a uh in fact no pericardium on this at least over the LV uh and portions of the RV usually there's a little bit of pericardium somewhere but this is an absence of the pericardium pr pretty much almost the entire pericardium being absent I just haven't seen a case of this in probably 5 years or so it's just something not very common uh, I don't remember what this case is. Let's see. Oh, yes, this is interesting. So it wasn't in my differential when someone showed me this case. You know, what's your differential for this? So large mass, left apex, well-rounded, clearly, I think, well, I think clearly uh, this line is too smooth and well demarcated. This is something that is not in the lung. It's going to be in the mediastinum or pleura or somewhere else, just not in, not in the lung. And then here was the chest CT, and I still, I, I, very interesting. Um, so this was all some sort of large fatty mass. So you can see the mass is going through the ribs here. It's like displacing the, the location of this rib laterally, and this fatty mass is going, you can see there's kind of a demarcation of it here. Um, it's basically this large chest wall, like Poma. I don't know if it's liposarcoma, but you know some large fatty mass that is kind of going through multiple planes, including the chest wall and mediastinum. And you always wonder what to do with these fatty masses. I mean, unless there's clearly some soft tissue component, I leave it alone. But you know, this one is very odd. So we were debating around, you know, do you send this for MRI? Do you just follow it? Do you do nothing? I don't know what other people think to do with those. And to kind of highlight that, um, here is the case. And so just to show, like we, we have some odd, I don't want to say odd protocols, but our protocols here, we do, so for our thin slice imaging, so we get 0 0.65s on everybody, and I read off the 0 0.65s for better or worse, but those tend to be a, uh, a narrower field of view and um, our larger field of view tend to be the thinner slices, kind of give a, if you're looking for someone has lymphoma or breast mass. Anyways, this was kind of scary because, you know, how many lipomas do we all see? We see lipomas all the time. We don't really do anything with them. And here is this, and I have to say that, you know, I, I kind of miss this portion a little bit later on. So here's this fatty wall, fatty mass in the chest wall that had been there not doing anything. And I think this is the study I read. And unfortunately, on this study, you actually, it's kind of cut off on those thin slices because of the field of view. But on the thicker, wider slices, down to the very bottom, you can see a little bit of soft tissue growing in this fatty mass that had been new. And then that continued to grow. And again, it gets cut off on our thin slices. That whole soft tissue component gets cut off. So unless you specifically look at the you know, thinner, sl uh, thicker slices, which I don't always do, you kind of miss the fact that there's this soft tissue component growing in it. So it's probably, you know, low-grade liposarcoma given the soft tissue component that's been growing over the last year or so, but just kind of a scary thing because, um, I mean, we all see lipomas all the time and 
I, I never recommend any sort of follow-up or anything for them. I just say, oh, the other thing that the, um, and just like multiple other things, if you look from one study to the next, there's no change. But if you look side by side, even the um, growth of this thing is, let's see if I can load them up side by side. Sorry. Uh, why can't I load these two? Anyways, let's see if I can, if you load them up side by side, you can actually see that this thing had been, so here is 2020, and here is uh, 2022, and you can see that this thing is also growing, but if you look from one study to the next, you wouldn't really appreciate it. Anyways, I still not gonna change me, I'm still not gonna recommend follow-ups for things that look like lipomas, but just kind of a reminder that, you know, these things, don't always turn out to be what you think they're going to be. But uh, Seth, do you think that could just be a blood vessel that's getting bigger as the uh, amount of fat that it's supplying gets bigger? I mean, it looks uh, like an elongated thing. Is that maybe just a vessel? Well, there was nothing ever there before. I mean, it's possible. We sent the patient for MRI, so yeah. we we don't know. Um, and there's really no nothing there on the prior like there's no hint of a vet it, it could be dave i i'm I, i'm not gonna lie. i'm not sure um okay. it may turn out to be nothing but uh like this is a vessel this little guy coming across here right like this more i don't know but it's you know it is growing if you look at the you know deformation of the chest wall this thing is is uh so this is about the same level you can see it is definitely getting bigger so is MRI going to help with the have a, you know, capacity to um, degenerate into liposarcomas, I guess. So we had to scrutinize all lipomas now carefully for any changes like this. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what it will turn out to be, but um, yeah, no, it's very good pickup by one of our fellows. I mean, again, this had been missed, <laughs> I think, by everyone in our, in our, you know, it's like a breast cancer follow-up patient, right? And so you're looking at everything and you're looking for Mets and you see the lipoma, you're like, yeah, whatever, and you don't go back. It's not like an adenocarcinoma where you're looking to see subtle ground glass nodule growth. You just say, um, and on the thin slice imaging, again, this whole soft tissue portion out here was cut off. And um, yeah, I mean, no harm, no foul because it was caught and it may turn out to be nothing. It's just a little scary. But yeah, that's that's what I got. What, what did you, Seth? What did you decide to do with the uh, first case that you showed with the in the in the upper thorax? Was that... oh the uh, you mean the the, the big the big yeah. fatty? I think we recommended an MR. Okay. Although I I was just going to leave it alone, um, but it's so bizarre. I don't know what would other people do with this. I guess what would M, what would MR show there? I mean, what you're I don't looking, know. Right? I don't. Maybe we recommended a chest fall, a CT fall. Well, first of all, we're not seeing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So we're only seeing, like, you can see there's kind of a, maybe we're imagining it, but it looks like there's kind of maybe a capsule here, where it's yeah. just putting everything and it's going up outside the field of view, and we don't know what's outside this field of view. So we kind of recommended maybe an MRI for yeah assessment of the entire structure. But you're right. I mean, um. I guess if I guess the, I guess you could also start if you're gonna worry about it, you might as well biopsy it. Yeah, but it, it, I think with a lot of those, right? I mean, even again, I, I'm not a soft tissue yeah. expert. I, I would imagine with some of these low grade lesions, yeah, you, know, you, you would have to get the perfect spot, right? To actually, get something because 99% of it is actually fat. Yeah. Now, do you um, guys do? Do you get a dedicated CT, like a focused MR for MSK protocol or? Yeah, this would, I I would just tell them to give it to MSK. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, I mean, if it was a mediastinal mass, we would do it ourselves. But given that it looks like the majority is kind of chest wall going up the neck, um, we were kind of, we kind of punted it to them. Yeah. I mean, what would other people do with this? I mean, I, I was actually tempted not to do anything, but other people kind of were like, well, you never know, you know, it's displacing structures, it's going into multiple planes. I I was like, okay, get an MR. Yeah. I think you'd want to at least uh, 
verified the whole thickness. It looks to me as if it could go up pretty high in the neck too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is the place of the trachea here too. I mean, it is. This, yeah, you want to map this lesion and know if it's having mechanical effects. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's um, absolutely. I, I think the whole lesion needs to be visualized. But let's, you know, let's say even if you saw the whole lesion in the chest, in the chest wall, and you saw the whole thing, would you do anything with it? Would you just say, well, it looks like a simple lipoma, even though it's kind of weird going in between? I, I mean, I've never seen one go between the chest wall and the mediastinum like that. I think technically you can't tell low grade, right? Technically you can't differentiate by imaging a low grade liposarc from a, a lipoma. So some people yeah. just tend to be more, it's just like a lot of things. Some people are more on the cautious side. So for almost every one, they'll use very, they'll be more conservative and recommend follow-ups or, and then other people just say it's a lipoma and move on. Yeah. My guess is most of this is actually extra plural, you know, I don't know how much the well they all connect, you know. Anyways, I pull back to the last statement. Um, yeah. So okay. we'll see what happens with that one. Seth, were you on when I showed the uh, IVC aneurysm? I my my audio on that thing. Uh, the reason it keeps dropping in and out is like I don't know what's going on with it. Uh, that workstation I worked only at this hospital one day a week, and it's the day of our conference. That workstation, that thing just drops out, and so the answer is. I was looking at the imaging and I wanted to know what the heck it was. And then I ran back up to another computer, logged on and saw it was an IBC aneurysm, which I've never seen. Did that person have any congenital things other than that? Uh, as far as I know, no, not, but I haven't investigated that history fully, but I, I figured if you hadn't seen it and um, if Travis not hadn't, seen it, then they don't exist. So. Not that big. I mean, I, we have cases of, I mean, I showed that case of Clipple Trinami Weber the other day that had that massive IBC and, branch veins that had CTEF because of that. Um, and I've seen a couple people with big IBCs, nothing like that though. That was really massive. I, I've not seen that before. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everyone for the really cool cases. I'll talk to everyone uh, next week. All right, take care. Yep. Bye-bye.